Today we are in Hebrews chapter 7, and I know we're looking at a lot of scripture today. Some of you looking at your bullet, you're going to say, wow, we normally cover like maybe five or seven verses at a time on a Sunday, and you're looking down, and you're thinking, what are we doing today? We're staying here a long time. It's, no. <laughs> but uh, we are going to cover the rest of the chapter. Just It all goes together, and you'll see how it all goes together, so I just didn't feel right about splitting it up. So why don't you stand with me, open your Bible up to Hebrews 7. And let me read all these verses, starting in verse 11, where it says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they had become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn will not relent to our priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, because since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which became after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our perfect priest. And thank you, Lord, that you made provision for him to be our priest. And we can know with confidence that he is our Savior, our God the one who forgives us our sins. So, Lord, help our eyes turn to Jesus today as we rejoice in him and we read this in your word and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Qualifications are, of course, very important. We don't trust anyone to just, you know, claim or do what they, they say they can do. If you want to a back surgery or if you need a knee replacement you want a surgeon with a sharp uh, head on his or her head went to school has a steady hand you don't want somebody who you know stayed at a holiday in express last night as the old ad goes if there isn't a legitimate basis for them to do what they say they can do you don't want them anywhere near a scalpel how much more confidence should we want for the qualifications of our Savior and our high priest? If Jesus does not fit the biblical qualifications for him to serve as our high priest, then how can we trust any priestly work that he claims to do? And we need more than just simple assertions from men about what he might be able to do. We need solid biblical declarations from God showing who Jesus is and what he does. And that foundation is crucial for our faith. Now, the writer of Hebrews has already said much about Jesus' role as our high priest. We saw in chapter 2, he wrote of Jesus' incarnation, making him a merciful and faithful high priest, making propitiation for the sins of the people, chapter 2, verse 17. In chapter 4, we read of our compassionate high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses, and though he was tempted, he is without sin, in chapter 4, verse 15. In chapter 5, the writer took us through some of the various qualifications of the high priest, how he's to be appointed by God, how he's to have compassion, how he's to present offerings to God, demonstrates how Jesus fit all of them. Now, he, he left out one important issue that's addressed here in our text today. But it was at that time that we were introduced to the order of Melchizedek chapter, uh, in chapter 5, but that comes from Psalm 110, verse 4. 
And that's when the writer broke off to discuss some issues pertaining to spiritual maturity, the assurance that we have of our salvation. But it's at the opening of chapter 7 that the writer returns to this discussion of the priesthood, particularly in reference to this order of Melchizedek. Now, before any conclusions can be made, groundwork needed to be laid, and the author gives some background on the historical man named Melchizedek. The sole biblical narrative that describes him is found in Genesis 14, another brief mention in Psalm 110. And what little the Bible says about him is absolutely fascinating. We find that he is a precursor to Christ, if not being Christ himself. But he is the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He's seemingly without beginning. He is without end. And most importantly uh, to the writer, at least at this point, is that Melchizedek was shown to be greater than Abraham and by extension, greater than the entire Levitical priesthood. See, they symbolically paid tithes to Melchizedek. They received blessing from Melchizedek. His priesthood preceded theirs, and it was never replaced by them. That's how we opened up chapter 7. In the remainder of chapter 7, the writer brings all of this home. Ancient Melchizedek sets the precedent for another priesthood, sets the precedent for a superior priesthood. And Jesus takes that precedent and he fulfills it. Not only does he have the greater priesthood, he himself is the greater priest. He is perfectly qualified to be our high priest, and we can have full confidence that he is our priest. So we look at chapter 7, and the first part, verses 11 through 19, talk about this greater priesthood. But verse 11 says, Therefore, if priesthood were through the Levitical, let me start that again. Verse 11 says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? So the author, right from the start, he lays out this supposition that, that carries the argument through the rest of the chapter that the Levitical priesthood is insufficient. Now, he gives this supposition in the form of a question. He starts with this if. And here the if is not presuming that the premise is true, that perfection came through the Levitical priesthood. Rather, it presumes and assumes that the premise is false, right? Is, the perfection surely does not come through the Levitical priesthood. Otherwise, there'd be no need for another priesthood to exist. If the only priesthood that's ever required is the Le Levitical priesthood, why should there be any other God-ordained priesthood at all but there is the very fact that there is one that that god gave another priesthood demonstrates some insufficiency within levi now that's not to suppose that everything about the levitical priesthood is bad the author makes a specific point that it's through the levitical priest that the people received the law that the, the levites were good even though they're insufficient because through them israel learned the law they 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 uh you know received the law they were the ones who those priests were the ones who brought the sacrifices on behalf of the people, and every animal that they slew and sacrificed was a symbol that points to the eventual sacrifice of Jesus at the cross. All that work is good, is beneficial, it's necessary within Israel. The writer of Hebrews never implies otherwise. But the problem is, is that the Levitical priests did not offer perfection. Now that term should stand out because it's been used repeatedly throughout the book of Hebrews. It's already been used three times to this point in the book, it's actually used 12 times total without the book. And importantly to our own text, it's used three times within chapter 7 by itself. Verse 11, verse 19, verse 28. So it not only comes in the middle of this section, but it bookends the section. There's something important about perfection when it comes to the priesthood, something that the author is trying to point out. By the way, when it comes to Bible study, an important part of observation is repetition. If you see a word repeated, it's worth circling or highlighting it. Because God's obviously drawing attention to that idea, drawing attention here to perfection. Move on in verse 12. It says, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change in the law. Now that makes sense at first glance. If there is an additional priesthood outside of that, which is detailed within the law of Moses, then there needs to be something done in the law to accommodate that change. First glance makes perfect sense. It's the second glance that causes issues. Because what might make this original Hebrew Christian audience sit up and pay attention and maybe even cringe as they raise some questions is the idea that the steadfast law of God might change at all. If, 
as the Psalms declare, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, Psalm 19, verse 7. How could it be that that which is already perfect needs a change, have a necessity to be changed? Interestingly, there are two different Greek words translated change in verse 12. The first is uh, metatithemi, which might refer to a change in location, a transfer could also refer to a change of condition, something's altered, a change of mind. The second is metathesis, and that speaks of removal, speaks of transformation. Now, obviously, there's overlap in the terms, but there is nuance I think that's helpful. If the priesthood is to be transferred from Levi to Melchizedek, that's metatithemy change, then the law needed some kind of transformation, that metathesis change. They go together. And as will be seen, the Mosaic law is abundantly clear that the priesthood belongs to Levi or Aaron. But it needs to be transferred. So that's not something that's easily overcome. Some kinds of change needs to happen, which is why the author spends so much time detailing that change in this chapter and indeed in the chapters yet to come. Now in this, I want to emphasize that we don't want to assume that the author of Hebrews ever implies that there's something wrong with the law. And when we go to heaven, we'll be able to ask the author of Hebrews, once we finally identify him and figure out who he is, and we'll be able to ask him face to face if he agrees with, he, with, with Psalm 19, verse 7, that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, and he will undoubtedly give an enthusiastic yes. Of course, he agrees with that. The law is given by God to his people. is absolutely perfect. It accomplishes exactly what God intends for it to do. It is still God's word. And even in the, the words of the author of Hebrews, it's still sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, verse 12. The law of God is all of these things. It's wonderful. But as is the point here, the law is limited as to what it does. And when there is a need for something outside the scope of the law, at this point referring to that specific covenant between God and Israel, then there must be some kind of biblical, underscore biblical, accommodation that allows for this necessary change. See, what the author of, doing, uh, what the author of Hebrews is not doing here is, is that he's not making stuff up on the fly. And he's not just coming up with an idea, claiming it as some sort of spiritual revelation, and then passing it off as new doctrine for Christians. Be careful not to think that's what he's doing, because that's not at all what he's doing. All that the writer is teaching in this book is already biblical-based. Even when its foundation is found in the writings outside of the, we might say, the, the covenant, the Mosaic covenant that's encapsulated in Deuteronomy. He's asking his readers to consider some monumental changes to their thinking, a, a true transformation of their thoughts regarding the temple, regarding the, the priesthood. He can't do that with a Hebrew audience just by making stuff up claiming that it was shown to him by an angel somewhere, that he'd come up with some prophecy on his own, unverified by Scripture. You no, know, the only way he's going to be able to convince his Hebrew Christian audience is by going back to the Scripture for his teaching, going back to the Scripture for his logic, even if it isn't the normal passages of Scripture that people went to when they're looking for information about the priesthood. Do you understand that? Everything he's doing here is Bible-based. All of it's founded on the perfect Word of God. By the way, all doctrine should be the same way. No Christian should receive claims from men and women about new doctrines that were, are without basis in the Bible. Amen. I just saw a video of a TV preacher saying that he received revelation from an angel. And if I named the name, you would roll your eyes just like I did. But just because he received supposedly revelation from an angel doesn't mean that what he received was biblical. In fact, for that matter, it doesn't mean that what he received was from a godly angel. Just because somebody claims prophecy doesn't mean that it is. So how can we know? How can we prove these claims? Paul specifically tells us to test all things, hold fast to what is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. The Bible tells us that prophecy is to be judged. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29. So how do we test these things? How do we judge these claims? We judge them by the standard of Scripture. Because the word of God is our final rule of authority. It is the standard by which everything else is judged. Which means we need to know it if we are to judge by it. Because you can't test something as true if you don't know the standard by which we can determine its authenticity. 
We follow? Okay, now as to the, the need for this change in the priestly law, the writer is just going to get to the elephant in the room. It's Jesus' tribal lineage. Look at verses 13 and 14. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Two simple facts are stated. They are undisputed. Regarding the tribal ancestry of Jesus, regards how it relates to his role of priest. The first is that of Jesus, the he of whom these things are spoken, right? That's Jesus, our Lord Jesus. He is not of the tribe of Levi. He is of the tribe of Judah. And no one from Judah has ever officiated at the altar for the simple reason that the ministry of the altar was not given to Judah. It was given to Levi. And of course, that's the second fact. The second fact is of the tribe of Judah, Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Look at it from Exodus to Deuteronomy. You do a thorough search there. There is not one word from Moses ever leaking the priesthood with the tribe of Judah. Every ordinance spoken by Moses, of course, given him by Almighty God, referred to the priesthood. It always referred to the tribe of Levi and specifically to the lineage of Aaron. Keep in mind, not even Moses was a priest. Although he was Aaron's brother, Moses was the chosen prophet of God. In fact, uh, Scripture infers that he acted symbolically as king in Jeshurun, which is another name for Israel in Deuteronomy 33, verse 5. Moses acted in those roles, but Moses was not the priest. That ministry belonged to his brother Aaron and to Aaron's sons. And you say, well, so what? What does it matter that Jesus came from Judah and the priesthood came from Levi and Aaron? Well, in terms of the law, it matters quite a bit. Because our God, our God is the righteous God. Our God is the non-contradictory God. Our God is not a God of confusion. And if God declared the priesthood is given to a tribe other than Judah, yet the Messiah is to come from Judah while also acting as priest, according to Psalm 110, this presents some kind of obstacle that needs to be addressed. And that's exactly what's addressed in this passage, again, from the pages of the Bible. Now, the fact that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, and by the way, that's by necessity because the Messiah is to be the rightful heir of David, and David was of the tribe of Judah. He had to come from Judah. Messiah had no choice except to come from Judah. It does emphasize one other similarity between Jesus and this historical man named Melchizedek, something that's crucial to the argument of the writer of Hebrews, is that these men combine the office of king and priest. Remember that not only does Melchizedek's name translate to king of righteousness, but his actual role was that of being king of Salem. And Salem was the city that was the precursor to what became eventually known as Jerusalem. Melchizedek was both king and priest, something that's otherwise impossible within the Mosaic law. The law specifically designated Levi as a priestly tribe, prophecy, uh, within the law shows the royal scepter of monarchy belonging to Judah. Genesis 49, verse 10. Scepter will never depart from Judah. Now, although there were high priests in history who served as guardians for young kings, we think of Jehoiada and Joash in 2 Chronicles 22 and 23, some that are valued counselors for certain kings, we'll read about Hilkiah this coming Wednesday in 2 uh, Chronicles 34, there was no way, zero way, for a Levitical priest to be king. And likewise, for the king in the reverse direction, the Davidic king might perform some religious functions, might lead prayer, might write psalms of worship, might gather the people together for worship, those sorts of things, but the king was never, never, never permitted to act as priest. The classic example is Uzziah, who tried to burn incense in the temple and was punished by God with lifelong leprosy in 2 Chronicles 26. And Uzziah was a good king, was a very good king, but his usurpation of the priestly functions went too far. So when it came to kings and priests within the Mosaic law, those things did not mix. But all this changes in Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is not a priest of the order of Levi, of Aaron. He's a priest of the order of Melchizedek. And in that order, tribal origin does not matter because that priesthood is outside the family of Israel altogether. 
It's neither dependent on the covenant made with Israel, nor is it dependent on the tribal makeup within Israel. And being separate from it, it becomes fully acceptable for the king to be priest and vice versa. These offices come together in Jesus. They come together only in Jesus. We cannot be priests in the order of Melchizedek because, among other things, we are not kings. Now, we're members of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, according to 1 Peter 2, verse 9. That's because of our inheritance in Jesus, but he is king, we are not. Amen. And even when you compare King uh, Jesus among the kings of the earth, Jesus stands apart because he's king of kings, he's lord of lords. So he alone fits the qualifications of the Melchizedekian priesthood. We look to him alone. We'll see some more reasons why in just a minute. Verses 15 and following, and it is yet far more evident... If in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, there is an interesting contrast between verses 14 and verse 15. And this is another area you might want to circle in your Bibles. I know some people don't like writing in your Bibles. Feel free to write in your Bibles. Now, if it's on your cell phone, that gets kind of weird. But uh, feel free to write in your Bibles. In verse 14, it's evident that Jesus' genealogy is that of Judah. In verse 15, it's far more evident, you see that contrast, far more evident that another priest has arisen. Those Greek terms are interesting. They're, they're variants on the same root word, uh, referring to something that's evident and clear. Pro de los, kata de los, if you're interested in which words they are. Uh, de los is the root word there. They're based on the same one. The difference between the two is slight, but I think we can perhaps see the difference in what was previously apparent in the Mosaic law because that first word for evident in verse 14 talks about what was previously apparent, what could be seen ahead of time. When it came to the lineage of the Messiah rising from Judah, well, that's something that was clearly evident beforehand. That was commonly prophesied. It was an essential part of the Davidic covenant with God. That's something all Israel expected. But then something happened in history which fundamentally changed perspective on every prophecy in the entire Bible. What was that? Happened in 33 AD when Jesus rose from the dead. See, Jesus' resurrection makes other things evident, might say far more evident, things which may not have been as clear in the past, but now are plain as the noses on our faces. Jesus' resurrection changes the way we look at Melchizedek, particularly at the announcement of his endless priestly order in Psalm 110, verse 4. The endless, in other words, we might say the resurrected life of Jesus, automatically demonstrates that he fits the pattern of another priesthood, not one dependent on one's birth from the tribe of Levi. We see it in Psalm 110. Now we say, would that have been immediately evident to David at the time that David wrote Psalm 110? Probably not. Now, King David wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he understood all of the theological implications of everything that he wrote. Certainly, he understood he was writing of his own descendant as the Messiah. Recall in Psalm 110, verse 1, it starts off, the Lord said to my Lord, So he understood that much. No doubt David was familiar with the Genesis 14 account about Melchizedek. And he understood this baseline idea that the Melchizedekian priesthood would somehow last forever, was somehow connected with the Messiah. David had at least a a foundational, fundamental notion that the Messiah would live forever. That was part of his own promise that he received from God. Do you remember that covenantal promise? Turn there if you want. I don't have a slide for it if if you want to turn there. It's 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13. It says, when your days are fulfilled, just spend a little time here, won't be long. When you, your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God specifically told David, your son, this Messiah, he's going to have a forever kingdom. So he's going to live forever. Those basic facts, that was known to the ancient king. But how those facts would be accomplished most likely a mystery to him. It's doubtful that David understood how long it would be after his death until the Messiah was given. David probably didn't have a clue of how exactly the Messiah's throne would be established forever, particularly when he later compared God's promise uh, to him 
to have this established forever, this throne established forever with the revelation that he received from God was concerning Psalm 22 about the Messiah being crucified. He knew that it would happen, but he didn't likely know how it would happen. And it would have been that same way with other scholars in Israel as well as other faithful men and women who were studying the Tanakh, right? the Torah, the, the, the writings of prophets. Uh, they would see prophecies that almost seem to compete with one another when they're looking at their Old Testament, their Hebrew Bibles. On one hand, the Messiah, well, he's supposed to have this victorious, everlasting kingdom. But on the other hand, they see these prophecies that say the Messiah is supposed to suffer and be rejected by his people. They don't understand how this can all fit together. And sometimes they came up with this idea that there would be two Messiahs. One Messiah would come from David. One Messiah would come from Joseph. One Messiah was used to reigning. One Messiah was used to suffering. They didn't understand how these things would fit together. But this is where the clarity of Jesus' cross and his resurrection comes in. Because when Jesus rose from the grave, what happened? All of a sudden, all these other prophecies had come into focus. All these other prophecies make sense. Yes, the Messiah was rejected, but yes, he also is victorious. Yes, the Messiah would be killed, but yes, he also lives forever. So things that were evident in the past become far more evident in the light of Jesus' resurrection. Guys, we could say something similar about the entire gospel. People think many, many different things about Jesus. Some imagine him to be a revolutionary. Some imagine him to be this meek, moral teacher. But the resurrection changes everything. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead demonstrates him to be Lord, demonstrates him to be almighty God in the flesh. The resurrection is clear evidence of his deity. The resurrection is clear evidence of the truth of Christianity. The resurrection puts to lie every other religious claim to God. Any potential doubt that Jesus actually is the Son of God is put to rest through the resurrection from the dead. Because the fact that Jesus lives and that he lives forever is clear evidence that the gospel is true. And that's something to which you need to respond in faith. Now, how is Jesus' resurrection, how does that relate to the Melchizedekian priesthood? It's the very sign of the priesthood. Look again at your Bible. Or is quoting from Psalm 110, verse 4 here, at the end of verse 17. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. See, the Melchizedekian priesthood is a forever priesthood. It's an eternal priesthood. And the Greek word here for forever is the word for eternal. As we actually transliterate sometimes eon. It goes on for eon after eon after eon. It points to, and it requires an eternal life. It requires an eternal physical life, real life. And how can you know that a life is actually eternal rather than just really, really, really long that will eventually die? Adam lived a really, really long life. Methuselah lived a really, really, really long life. Well, how do you know they won't die eventually? You only know that death is gone when death has been conquered. When the life is victorious over the grave, having defeated the grave, that's how you know it's eternal, that it's endless. And that's what Jesus did in his resurrection. Because when he rose from the grave, he rose from the grave for how long? Forever. Death has no hold on him because Jesus defeated death. Thus, his resurrection is proof of his endless life, which itself verifies the Melchizedekian priesthood. So if the resurrection is evident proof of the change in this law regarding and that governs priesthood, what does that say about the law? We'll look at verses 18 and 19. For on one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So this takes us back to that premise in verse 11, that the Levitical law is insufficient. When it comes to our need for true and eternal salvation through the promised Messiah... Well, then the law of the Levites, that falls short. It's weak. It's unprofitable in that manner. Now, again, that's not to say that it's bad. All we're saying here is acknowledging is that it's limited. We need perfection, verse 11. But verse 19, the law makes nothing perfect. The Levitical priests could do a lot in Israel in offering sacrifices to God for temporary atonement for sin, but the priests could never fully take away sin. They can never offer full and free total forgiveness for sin. Oh, they had good purposes, the Levitical priest said. They had holy purposes in Israel, but offering perfection, perfect salvation, that was not one of them. In that goal, their 
as weak as possibly could be. They're unprofitable as any other religious solution. The law falls short on this account. So if we cannot hope in the law, then we must hope in something or someone who can draw us near to God. What do we need? We need real hope. We need a better hope. We need the true hope that's offered through the Melchizedekian priesthood, which is offered to us in Jesus. Now, question. When it comes to this idea of weak and unprofitable in the law, is all the law set aside? Is all the law irrelevant? And if so, how can we re reconcile this teaching here in Hebrews 7 with the idea in Paul's teaching that the law is good? Romans 7, verse 12. For that matter, how can we reconcile this teaching with what Jesus said when he said he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets and that not one thing, not one jot, not one tittle would pass from the law until all is fulfilled in Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Okay, in all Bible scripture and interpretation, scripture must first be interpreted with its, within its own context. So if we look at Jesus' statement in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, he speaks of the fulfillment of the law, and we know Jesus is himself that fulfillment. When you think about what Paul was writing in Romans 7, Paul wrote that the law is holy and good and that it teaches us what sin is, but he says it's limited in what the law can do about sin. The law shows us our sin. The law does not solve it, right? Paul wrote the same thing to the Galatians. He wrote that the law is our schoolmaster, our tutor, our pedagogos to take us to Christ, to be justified by faith. But once faith comes, we're no longer under that tutor, right? Galatians 3. All of this shows a consistent pattern. Each scripture in its context, it shows us in all these sections that the law shows us our need for Jesus and Jesus fulfills our need. It's no different whatsoever in Hebrews 7 is exactly the same thing. The whole context in this passage is that of the priesthood. The Levitical priesthood was established by the law for the people within the covenant of the law. But what happens if that covenant is set aside? What happens if that covenant is even fulfilled? What happens when there is a people in a new covenant as chapter 8 is going to go on and demonstrate? Well, at that point, the law of Moses governing the Levitical priests cannot help us. We who are not included in the Mosaic covenant are not governed by Mosaic law. We talked about this last time, right? They serve great as principles, but they don't serve as ordinances for us. Even church age, born again, believing Jews, Jews who come to faith in Jesus right now, they're not currently governed by the Mosaic Covenant. How can you say that so surely? Because there ain't no temple. <laughs> there's no animal sacrifice. Now, at the time Hebrews was written, the temple still stood, but it wouldn't stand for too much longer. Today, what does the Bible tell us? There's one body of believers in Christ, the church. And Paul wrote to the Ephesians how Jesus has broken down the middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile, making one new man from two. Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. Jesus does not have multiple bodies on earth during this present age, during this present dispensation. He has one. He has the church. Now, once the church is taken out, raptured to himself, covenant of law, well, that's reestablished a new temple during the Great Tribulation. That is not now. Now is the age of the church with the Levitical priesthood, along with all of its laws, temporarily annulled, temporarily set aside. Do we follow? All right. Talking about the priesthood, let's talk about a greater priest, starting in verse 20 and following. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, in this parenthetical statement, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent to our priests forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. It's really a, kind of a simple point he's making here. Jesus was made priest... Uh, with an oath. But the author does this from several angles. First, he states it in the negative. Then he provides this contrast with the Levites. And then he restates it in the positive, and he shores it up with this quote from Psalm 110, verse 4. He's looking at all these different angles. This is something he's not wanting his readers to misunderstand, so he's looking at it in every possible way that he could. Right? What's the big deal about God using an oath to declare Jesus as priest? It's showing here a stark contrast, a stark difference with the Levites. Because the Levites inherited their ministry how? By birth. Right? Their commission was not re-sworn to them in every generation. In fact, I looked for it as much as I could this week. You go look for it and see if you can correct me on this. 
I can't find anywhere in the Bible where God ever swore the priesthood to Levi. Now, there are other places where God took oaths, right? God swore to give Israel the land. God swore to give Israel their covenant, right? You see it in Genesis 24. You see it in Exodus 6. You see it in a lot of places. God swore that Moses, because he misrepresented God, he took an oath, and God swore that Moses would never enter the promised land, Deuteronomy chapter 4. But as to the priesthood, the Bible is clear that while God did give it to Aaron and his sons, and the Bible is very, very clear on that part, there is no record anywhere that God ever gave it to him via an oath. Now contrast that with Jesus. With Jesus, God did make him a priest via his oath. God swore to give this to Jesus, Psalm 110, verse 4. You are an oath, or uh, uh, sworn, right? Uh, where is it? The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He swore it. Thus it comes with the utmost authority. It comes with the utmost precedence. It's a higher priesthood than that of Levi because it's based on God's oath alone. Now, what else does God's oath do? God's oath gives us a guarantee of our salvation. And that's the point of verse 22. God's oath made Jesus a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And because Jesus is forever that priest king, remember that king of righteousness, king of peace, the priestly work he does is forever. It's eternal. The covenant that we have with God, this new covenant that's going to be detailed in chapter 8, is guaranteed through the eternal priesthood of Jesus that's why it says here that Jesus is himself the surety of our better covenant. Now, I know this isn't the main point of the passage. It's almost mis mentioned in, in passing, but it's so wonderful. So I want to spend just a minute on here because the covenant that God makes with us to forgive us our sins, make us his children, grant us eternal life, it's not based on us. It's not secured in us. If it was dependent on us, it wouldn't be secure at all. It's secured by Jesus. Jesus himself is our security. He is our guarantor. Think of it in terms of car loans. If you're a young adult, you're going to find it very hard. If you don't have any credit history to go out and get a car loan, you're going to need to have a co-signer to go with you. Why? Because they want some sort of guarantee that that monthly payment is going to be made. That co-signer is the guarantor for the loan. Jesus is our guarantor. Not because he co-signs with us, expecting us to make the payment. No, Jesus already made the payment in full. Then he brings us into relationship with God based on his own payment, his own character, his own person. He's our surety. He's our security. And apart from Jesus, we've got no promise of being in God and have blessing in God. But in Jesus, we are guaranteed our salvation because Jesus himself guarantees it. So Jesus is our forever priest. He's a wonderful high priest. He guarantees our covenant with God proven through his resurrection, proven through God's own oath that's recorded in Scripture. Well, how does that compare with other priests of the past? Verse 23 and 24, there are other many high priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. There are a lot of priests in the past of the lineage of Aaron. Each of them, quite literally, had an expiration date. Not to be crass about it, but you can't be a priest if you're dead. They all died. How different it is with Jesus. His resurrected life ensures an everlasting priesthood. His own ministry is unchangeable by death as he continues forever. He's the one priest who conquered death. He's the only priest that we need. I know we're short on time, but I want to give you a little bit of information that the Mormons take from this. For all the, the mystery that surrounds Melchizedek, one of the things we know about his priesthood is that it cannot be claimed by men or churches with their own priestly orders, and that's what Mormonism does. Now, Mormons who listen to this will get upset that I'm calling them Mormons because they call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're just going to call them Mormons. <laughs> they claim that Adam was the first to have the Melchizedekian priesthood rather than, you know, Melchizedek. Take that for what it is. And they claim that that Melchizedekian priesthood was given to Adam, and it was suspended for a little bit, and it took place in the, the initial uh, apostolic period, and it was taken away from the earth, and then it was conferred again upon Joseph Smith via miraculous revelation. I'm not making that up. That's taken from their own website. Now, aside from the rest of the heresies in their cult, 
the clear teaching from the book of Hebrews is that aside from the original Melchizedek, who might have actually have been Jesus, there is only one priest in all history that's been of the order of Melchizedek, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. not of Latter-day Saints. He alone was given this priesthood with the oath of God. He alone confirms it through his resurrection. And while we benefit from his priesthood, we ourselves are not Melchizedekian priests. Right? That, that Mormon doctrine is wrong. It's even blasphemous because it puts men into the same category as our Lord Jesus and thus demotes Jesus and it promotes men. Now that's consistent with the rest of their heretical theology. So despite their claims, guys, let's stop agreeing with them that they're Christians. They, they might share some ethical values that we promote in our Bible, but they don't worship the same Savior. They don't worship the same God. And we need to stop pretending that they do. Now, back to our text. Of Jesus' unchanging forever ministry, it says in verse 25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus' life means that Jesus is able to save. And when Jesus saves, he doesn't save partway. He saves to the uttermost. And how long is he able to do it? He's able to do it forever because he always lives. So what does Jesus do in his forever life? Well, he makes intercession for those who come to God through him. It doesn't get better than that because what do we need? Constantly. We constantly need a qualified high priest. How long do we need him? We're going to need him forever. We're going to need him as long as we exist even. If we think all that through, right? We don't need Jesus only for this life. As long as our hearts keep beating here on earth. No, we need Jesus a lot longer than this life. We need Jesus into eternity because eternity is what's on the line for each of us. And as long as we're saved in Jesus, we're saved. But if there happened to be a moment that Jesus' work of intercession would be used up and gone, we'd be immediately consumed in the wrath of God. You don't need Jesus' work of salvation just for the next 5, 10, 20 years. You need it for the next 2,000, 2 million, 2 trillion years. Thankfully, Jesus never leaves. Thankfully, Jesus' work never runs out. Remember from verse 24, he has an unchangeable priesthood. Verse 25, we're told he always lives. He's never going to disappear. His intercessory work on our behalf will never falter. It will never fail. It will continue into eternity, being effective unto our eternal salvation. Amen. Now, I say that in terms of good news from heaven. It is good news for heaven. It's also good news for right now. Because there's never going to be a day that you run out of the grace of God. You're not going to wake up one morning saying and, and hearing from God, sorry, buddy, you used it all up. I got no more priestly ministry, no more grace left for you. When you belong to Jesus, abiding in Jesus, having faith in Jesus, you forever belong to Jesus. He will always intercede on your behalf. His grace is always available. So what kind of priest is Jesus? He's the kind of priest we need. Look at verse 26 and 27. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. It is suitable, it's fitting to have Jesus as our high priest because he is pure. You can't ask for a priest that's better than Jesus. Now you're talking about holy priest. Was Aaron holy? Well, sure, to an extent, by the grace of God, but he wasn't perfectly holy. No Levitical priest is perfect because no human is perfect, but that's the kind of priest we need. We need somebody that's perfect. We need somebody who is, on one hand, like us, and then he can understand us, but we also need somebody who's different from us, who doesn't fall in the same way that we do. That's Jesus. He's like us in that he's human. He fully understands our weaknesses towards sin, but he's unlike us in that he's God, and he's perfect in every respect. And so the author of Hebrews here lists a few traits. He's holy, and here holy speaks of piety, speaks of devoutness. Nobody worships God like Jesus worships. He's holy. He's harmless. Literally saying he's without evil. He's without guile. He's undefiled. He requires no ritual to purify him. He is inherently pure. Then he's separate from sinners. Now, that's not in the holier than thou looking down your nose at your face kind of separation. No, Jesus is separate simply because he doesn't sin. Now, he took our sin upon himself. But Jesus has never and would never, ever experience the act of sinning itself against God. He's, he's separate from that. Then it says here that he's higher than the heavens, translated by some Bibles as exalted, probably referring to Jesus' nobility and glory far surpassing the heavens. That's who he is. And the bottom line is that no priest has a better character than does Jesus. 
He's the best that there is, the best that will ever be. This is the priest we need, the one who can minister on our behalf and into eternity. And because of Jesus' purity, because of his glory, he has no need to offer sacrifices for himself. Other priests, they had to do that on a daily basis. Before they could offer any sacrifice on behalf of the nation, on behalf of any individual, they first have sacrifices on behalf of themselves, their own sin, not Jesus. Jesus' one sacrifice is enough. And there's a lot to unpack there, and the writer will do that in later chapters, but just expand on that point one bit. It says in verse 28, for the law appoints as high priests, men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Now the law is good. When it appointed men as priests, that was good, but it could only appoint those who were available. You can only work with what you got, right? And the only men that were available were sinful men, men full of weakness, this was part of the weakness of the priestly law itself, as we saw in verse 18. But that's one more reason why the oath of God concerning the Melchizedekian priest is so much better. Because the law made priests out of weak, sinful men, the oath of God gives us a pure and perfect son as our priest. And it's his perfection that ties together this whole section. Remember, this is a repeated uh, idea here. In verse 11, we saw that perfection did not come from the Levitical priest, although perfection is what we require. In verse 19, we saw that the law doesn't make anything perfect because that's not its function. But regarding perfection, it's weak and useless, the law is. In verse 28, we find that Jesus is perfect and he's been perfected forever. What we need is perfection. We don't have it. We can't achieve it. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. And without the work of a perfect high priest, we've got no hope in God. But then Jesus gives us the perfect high priest, Amen. forever appointed by God on our behalf, performing exactly for us the work we require. You know, one of the potential downfalls of many evangelical studies is that we look at the, the Bible here and we're always looking for ourselves in the text. We're just egotistical that way, right? We look for what it says about us first, before we look at what the text says. The truth is the text isn't always about us. We're not always the intended audience. And although, uh, of course, we can, we should look for God's intended application in our lives in the text, we shouldn't first look for us in the text. We should always look for what God's saying to the original audience in the original context. And in this case, we find God's word given to Christians from a Hebrew background. The author has a really, really difficult argument to make in front of faithful Hebrews. Because he has to argue why that the priestly system that's commanded in the perfect law of God and the only system they ever knew, he has to argue why that is insufficient and how somehow in God's word it predicted a better priest, one that the rest of the nation didn't naturally expect, but now should be obvious when you look back on Jesus. That's a tough argument to make, but it's important to make it. It's vital even to make it. Because until these Hebrew Christians understood the biblical validity of Jesus' priesthood, they would have a lot of reason to mistrust and distrust the rest of the doctrines of Christianity. And instead of seeing it as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, they would see it as a different religion entirely and just go back to what they knew. So it makes sense why the writer spends so much time digging into these issues, carefully detailing the biblical reasons why all people, Jew and Gentile alike, can know that Jesus is our God-ordained priest, having a perfect priesthood, even though he comes from the tribe of Judah. From a Jewish perspective, that's a really, really important argument to make. Now that said, it has a lot of application to a mostly Gentile church as well. Because it's not just the tribes of Israel who require the work of a high priest. See, the priest was there to atone for the sins of the people. The priest was there to serve as a mediator between the people and God. The priest was there to intercede on behalf of the people to God. Don't Gentiles require that as much as Jews? Do not Gentiles require a biblically qualified priest just as much as Jews? Well, of course we do. And think about it. If Jesus did not qualify as a perfect high priest of Israel, then neither would he qualify as a perfect high priest for the church. Because if the Bible offered no support for Jesus to serve in that priestly role, then he would not have no priestly service for either Israel or the church. And unless Jesus perfectly fits the biblical qualifications and prophecy, he would not be the true Messiah. We would not have hope. See, it isn't only Israel's confidence in Jesus' fulfillment of Scripture that provides a foundation for their faith in him. It's ours as well. 
Beloved, we, we don't have just a maybe kind of confidence of Jesus that he might fit the qualifications to save us. The idea that Jesus is both the qualified king and the qualified priest, that's not just an assertion. That's not an article of faith that we would have to accept without foundation. That's truth. That's surety. That's fact. We have every reason to trust Jesus as our better hope because of the oath of God and because of Jesus' physical resurrection. It testifies of his qualifications. So yeah, we have faith. Sure, we have faith, but we have informed reason for our faith because that reason is demonstrated in the Bible. So the question as we close for some of you is this, do you even have faith at all? Oh, there are many, many reasons to believe. There are many reasons to know that Jesus is exactly who he claims to be as our savior, as our king, as our priest. But no one is going to be saved apart from faith, apart from belief. And until you turn to Jesus, asking him to save you, and remember, he saves to the uttermost. You won't be saved until you ask. But you can ask him right now as we pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us the surety of this high priest to know that Lord, you've given us the priest, the right priest, in the right way, according to your word. We can know you have done everything to save us. And so, Lord, I would pray, first of all, for those who are not yet saved. They've not yet called upon Jesus as the truly resurrected Son of God, asking Jesus to forgive them their sins, asking Jesus to become their Lord and King, asking Jesus to make them a child of God. Help them do that right now, Lord. As they cry out to you in their hearts, help them see Jesus for who he is, Son of God, the Savior, the King, the Priest, and the one who loves us and says, Come to me, all who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you, Lord, for the rest we can have in Jesus. Thank you for the assurance we can have in Jesus. Thank you for all that he's done for us. And Lord, as we go from this place, help us go forward in confidence that the Christ that you have given is the perfect Christ and the one in whom is our better hope. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, amen. You all be wonderfully blessed. <laughs>